We turn to the only book that we need to study if we want to be wise. We're studying chapter 29 and 30 of the book of Jeremiah this morning. Came across a lovely little uh, cutting from a magazine this week. By the way, could we have the lights on up here? It's a dull morning and God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And I always feel it's much better to have a bit of light. Might help me too to be a little quicker. Uh, <laughs> Here is the cutting from the magazine. A lady writing said, As I was passing my nine-year-old daughter's door, I overheard her praying, and she said, Dear God, I like the Bible. Have you written any more books? <laughs> the answer is yes, he has written many more books. He has written the biography of every one of you. And one day on the Day of Judgment, those books will be opened and read. Every one of them. But he's written another book still, which I've never seen, you've never seen. But I just hope and pray your name's in it, because it's the Lamb's Book of Life, and one day that will be read too. But until we read those books, or until they're opened, this is the only book that you need to open if you want to be wise. There are many other books that will make you clever, but this one will make you wise. So we're studying the book of Jeremiah. And I want to read chapter 29 and 30. We listen to God here before we worship him. We listen to what he has to say to us, and then we respond as a family in prayer and praise. These are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah as the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. We shall come back to that, but that's God's idea of the welfare state. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for it is a lie which they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them sword, famine, pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs which are so bad they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword, famine, and pestilence, and will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them, because they did not heed my words, says the Lord, which I persistently sent to you by my servants, the prophets, but you would not listen, says the Lord. 
Hear the word of the Lord. All you exiles whom I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab the son of Kolaia and Zedekiah the son of Messiah, who are prophesying a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. Because of them, this curse shall be used by all the exiles from Judah in Babylon. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Because they have committed folly in Israel. They have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives, and they have spoken in my name lying words, which I did not command them. I am the one who knows, and I am witness, says the Lord. To Shemaiah of Nehalem you shall say, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are in Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada the priest, to have charge in the house of the Lord over every madman who prophesies, to put him in the stocks and collar. Now why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anathoth, who is proph prophesying to you? For he has sent to us in Babylon, saying, Your exile will be long. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, Send to all the exiles, saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah of Nehalem. Because Shemaiah has prophesied to you when I did not send him and has made you trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will punish Shemaiah of Nehalem and his descendants. He shall not have anyone living among this people to see the good that I will do to my people, says the Lord. For he has taught rebellion against the Lord. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land which I gave to their fathers and they shall take possession of it. These are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a cry of panic, of terror, and of no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hand on his loins like a woman in labor? Why is every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved from it. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break the yoke from off their neck, and I will burst their bonds, and strangers shall no more make servants of them. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease. And none shall make him afraid. For I am with you to save you, says the Lord. I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I scattered you. But of you, I will not make a full end. I will chasten you in just measure. And I will by no means leave you unpunished. For thus says the Lord, your hurt is incurable, and your wound is grievous. There is none to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you, they care nothing for you. For I have dealt you the blow of an enemy, the punishment of a merciless foe. Because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant. Why do you cry out over your hurt, your pain is incurable? Because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant, I have done these things to you. Therefore, all who devour you shall be devoured, and all your foes, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who despoil you shall become a spoil, and all who prey on you I will make a prey. 
I will restore health to you and your wounds I will heal, says the Lord. Because they have called you an outcast, it is Zion for whom no one cares. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt upon its mound and the palace shall stand where it used to be. And out of them shall come songs of thanksgiving and the voices of those who make merry. I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will make them honored and they shall not be small. Their children shall be as they were of old, and their congregation shall be established before me. And I will punish all who oppress them. Their prince shall be one of themselves. Their ruler shall come forth out of their midst. I will make him draw near, and he will approach me. For who would dare of himself to approach me, says the Lord? And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, a storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth. A whirling tempest, it will burst upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his mind. In the latter days, you will understand this. Well, now the key verse for this morning as you would guess, is you will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. I'm going to ask David Hull. He's going to sing the aria from Mendelssohn's Elijah, If with all your heart you truly seek me. heads for a prayer. Lord, you do know us better than anyone else, even better than we know ourselves. And Lord, we thank you that if there's anybody here who's not found you yet, that if they really bring their whole heart to you this morning and not seek you in any half-hearted way, that they need not leave this building without you. But may all of us come wholeheartedly 
Lord, people can sit and watch television for hours. We want to sit at your feet like Mary and listen to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. When we get to Jeremiah chapter 29, there are two major changes take place. The first is that Jeremiah switches from the spoken to the written word, and he starts writing letters and books. And the second is that he stops being so pessimistic and becomes optimistic, and the doom and gloom give way to a very rosy hope for the future. And I'm sure you sense the change of tone as we read through these two chapters. Now, these two changes are not unrelated. Let me try and explain. Words are very powerful things. They are weapons. Words can bring great blessing and they can bring terrible destruction. Many of the world's dictators have known just how powerful words can be. But the written word can be powerful as well as the spoken word. And in some situations, the written word has advantages of the spoken word. Now, Jeremiah lived before the days of tape recording, but not before the days of writing. Had he lived in the days of tape recording, he would have made a tape for the exiles in Babylon. Because that is the device we can now use to take a word through distance in space. And he needed to send his words a few hundred miles across the desert, so he wrote a letter. So here's the first advantage of the written over the spoken word. It can travel further than the spoken word. It certainly could before the days of radio and tape recording. Now, of course, that has really increased our capacity to spread the word. And so he wrote a letter. But there's another van advantage of the written word, and it's this. Not only can it travel great distances in space, it can also travel distances in time. Because at the moment, if I had no recording being made of this message, every word is lost. And it is limited in its effect to what you remember of it afterwards. And I don't expect you to remember everything. I'm not preaching a sermon for that purpose. I'm preaching a sermon in which I hope that God will say one thing to every single one of you at some point and that you'll remember that and go away and do something about it. But you see, if it's written, it can travel down through the centuries. The Chinese say if you want to be remembered after you're dead, then do one of four things. Build a house, plant a tree, have a son, or write a book. Because all those four things will go on influencing other people after you're gone. And so Jeremiah, who up to this point has relied on the spoken word, now turns to the written word. In chapter 29, he writes a letter which travels a great distance through space from Jerusalem to Babylon. In chapter 30, he writes a book which will come into its own in 70 years' time and will travel down through the decades and will therefore be used later. And here we are reading the book now, 2,400 years later. And so that's the advantage of writing. And so here we have Jeremiah moving from the spoken to the written word. Now because of this, that he is able to project his word through space and particularly through time into the future, he's able to turn from the pessimistic message of doom and gloom in the present to the optimistic message of hope in the future. You see how they're related. And he's able to write a book that is not doom and gloom but tremendously full of hope. He doesn't leave all of God's anger and wrath behind because that would be to distort the picture. And there are still little glimpses of God's anger, but most of it now is God's compassion, God's love, God's kindness. And I'm sure you're relieved to get to this after plowing through the doom and gloom since last October. Now let me just give you a little history lesson to give you the setting. Babylon is now a growing empire with satellite countries around it in very much the same relation to it, to it as Hungary and Poland and Czechoslovakia are to Soviet Russia. And Nebuchadnezzar's policy with countries that he took into the kind of overall circle was this. He would remove from the country as soon as he captured it all the top layer of society. It would include the political figures, the religious leaders, it even included the skilled craftsmen and smiths so that he left behind a population that could not rise again. A poor people with no leadership 
and then he would set over them a puppet king whom he thought he could keep under his control. Now, he wasn't brutal or harsh at any rate in his early days. He took away that top layer of society. He took them to his own country, which enhanced that with gifted people. And he gave them relative freedom to build up their own settlements within his empire, within his capital or near it. Now, have you got the picture? So that when Nebuchadnezzar first took Jerusalem, he took away 3,032 people to Babylon, all the top layer of society and all the skilled artisans took them all away, and he left behind some thousands of unskilled, illiterate, poor people. And he put in charge of them a man called Zedekiah, who he rightly discerned was a rather weak man, whom he could keep right there. And it is in that situation that Jeremiah, if you remember last week, said to those who were left behind, you are going to be obliterated. Almost as if God was going to build up a new nation from the choice Jews who'd been taken away. But Jeremiah now writes to those who have already suffered for their sins by being taken away from their homes. And therefore, having been chastened and punished, he can now speak to them more tenderly. You do the same with your children. When they've done wrong, you punish them. But when they've suffered a bit of punishment, don't you change and begin to talk to them gently and nicely and restore the relationship and try and get them back to where they were. And God begins to do this. And Jeremiah has to write to Babylon to begin to restore their confidence in God and the relationship between them. And so he's going to say to them, Now, now will you seek him with your whole heart. Now will you get back to the Lord, because if you get back to the Lord, you can come back to the land. So seek him with your whole heart and your future's rosy. But he also had to write for a negative reason. Because there were prophets appearing, self-styled prophets, false prophets appearing, not only in Jerusalem, denying Jeremiah's message, but appearing among the exiles in Babylon to say, it's all right, this empire is going to collapse in just a year or two, and we'll all be able to go back. Jeremiah said, that is not true. You will stay there for 70 years, and that gives you a chance to get right with the Lord. So you start seeking him hard. And one day God will bring you back. But the prophets out there in Babylon said, Rubbish, don't you listen to Jeremiah. One of them called Shemaiah even wrote a letter back to a priest in Jerusalem and says, God has told me that you must take over the job of high priest and you must put this crazy prophet called Jeremiah in the stocks. And that was the situation. Poor old Jeremiah, he stands alone. He stands alone in Jerusalem. He stands alone in the eyes of Babylon. And he's got to fight on two fronts now and speak to two groups of Jews, not one. The one around him and the one away there in exile. He can only speak to them by letter. And so chapter 29 is written as a letter. I think I've set the scene. The letter of chapter 29 to the exiles may simply be divided into three parts. A word of advice, a word of promise, and a word of warning. Now, I want you to take those three words as from God this morning to you. A word of advice, a word of promise, and a word of warning. Here's the word of advice. The instinct when you are a subjugated people is to resist and to escape. That's the instinct. This is what happened to many Frenchmen during the war when the Germans overran France. The human instinct is if you have the courage and the opportunity to join a resistant movement. When the Romans were occupying Israel, their instinct was to become zealots or terrorists. And our human instinct is not to like to be under the control of another nation and to want to get out of it or at any rate a policy of non-cooperation. The kind of policy that Gandhi adopted, a non-violent, passive, but non-cooperation with a colonial power. That's the human instinct to get our freedom back. And Jeremiah's word of advice from the Lord was twofold, colonize and cooperate. Don't try and escape. Don't try and resist. Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens. Get their produce. Have children. Have grandchildren. You're going to be there for 70 years. And my advice from the Lord is this. Cooperate with Babylon. 
Pray for it. Seek its welfare. Because if Babylon is blessed, you will be blessed. Your welfare depends on the occupying power. So cooperate. Now that is not popular advice to those who have been forcibly put under another power. And it never will be. That's one of the reasons the crowd was so disappointed with Jesus, because he would not lead an insurrection. They said, give us Barabbas. He, he's a terrorist. He'll get us free from this power. That's the message the world responds to. But Jeremiah had to say, God's advice is cooperate. Because the better Babylon is, the better you'll be. And therefore, seek its welfare, because therein lies your welfare. In other words, try and help Babylon all you can. That is God's will for you. The advice appears in the New Testament, as you know. Submit to those in authority. And that word was said when Nero was the emperor. It is not popular advice. To bring it right home, I've been consulted this very week by one of you about a situation in which, because this country is living above its financial means, the education authorities have been told they've got to cut some things. And in one case near Guildford, they are cutting a bus that is taking a few children back to a village. And the mothers have got together to make a protest and to stop this and withdraw their children from the school until they put that bus back on. And so a member of the congregation rings me up and says, what does a Christian do in that situation? See, so you're right in it here. Do you protest? Do you fight? What do you do? Well, in general terms, I think Christians have got to set an example, and it's going to be very unpopular and very costly. But we have got to say, if we find ourselves in this situation, I believe we've got to say, we are living above our means as a country. We are getting services that we can't afford. Therefore, we will give an example of living within our means, and we'll find some way to get our kids to school in some other way. But we're going to help the government. Because in its welfare lies our welfare. Now you can take me to task about that afterwards, but I'm trying to show you the kind of situation which Jeremiah was speaking, and he would get exactly the same reaction as I shall get from some of you, as I got last week on my remarks on Northern Ireland. But you see, Jeremiah had to give them unpopular advice that would put them out of gear with the popular feeling, which is fight the government. And so Jeremiah said, cooperate, build your houses, build your gardens. Pray for the Babylonian emperor who took you off in chains. Pray for him. That was his advice. And godly men followed that advice. That's why Daniel got so high in the Babylonian government. That's why later Esther cooperated with a foreign power. And the Bible is full of such examples. Verses 5 to 7 are in poetry. Build your houses and live in them. Plant your gardens and get their produce. Have, get wives for your sons and have children. Get wives and for your sons' sons and so on. It's, it's sheer poetry, this, but he's trying to make them a little poem, a doggerel that will be repeated around the streets. You see, as over against the divine wisdom, there is the human wish all the time. And the human wish is contrary to divine wisdom. The wisdom of God is foolishness to men and the human rational mind can't see the wisdom of God. Human wishes and divine wisdom are often poles apart and human wishes are often fostered by religious leaders who are prepared to tell people what they want to hear and Jeremiah says you've got dreamers and prophets out there in Babylon who are telling you what you want to hear. They're dreaming dreams, they're dreaming dreams of getting back to Jerusalem. Those dreams will not come true for 70 years so you build your houses and live in them. Don't listen to human wishes, even if they come from religious lips. Even if they come from people who claim to be speaking the word of the Lord. Lord, it's a lie, says Jeremiah. Choose between divine wisdom, which I offer you, and human wishes coming from your own prophets. And you cooperate and pray for Babylon and seek its welfare. Now, secondly, a word of promise. Even though he says you're going to be there for 70 years, and that's a long time, that's more than a generation, two generations. Even though you're going to be there 70 years, Jeremiah says, nevertheless, here's a word of promise, expect to return from Babylon. Don't get so deeply rooted there that when the time comes to come back, you can't uproot and return. Now here is a delicate balance. 
You're staying there, you're exiles and aliens, but stay there and cooperate. But never stay there so deeply that you can't leave it. Expect to come back because here's a word of promise. After 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. I'm giving you a hope and a future. I've got plans for your welfare. And I praise God I live in a welfare state. It's not a human one. It's a divine one. The kingdom of God is a welfare state. And God says, I have plans for your welfare. At the moment, your welfare lies in the welfare of Babylon. But I have plans to bring you to the place where I plan your welfare. And I've got a hope and a future for you. And now you get a lovely divine promise of God's faithfulness. He's made his plans. He will keep his promise. And in this next section, verses 10 to 14, five times God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. There'll be a wedding here on Saturday and two people will say, I will. But they'll only say it once each. I sometimes want to count up, if ever I had time, I'd count up how often God says, I will. He says it seven times, 17 times, or is it 19 times in the two chapters I just read to you. I will. I will bring you back. I will restore your fortunes. I will give you a hope. I will give you a future. I will plan your welfare. I will. That's the divine faithfulness. But God then reminds them through Jeremiah that divine faithfulness is often matched by human fickleness. We've just sung it, great is thy faithfulness. Yes, it is. But we ought also to sing, great is our fickleness, O God our Father. What do I mean by that? I mean that in spite of the fact that God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, we are still half-hearted about it. That's what I mean. In spite of the fact that he plans a glorious future for his people, we can be half-hearted even in singing hymns about it. And so God says, if with all your heart, that's the response I'm looking for. I'll give you a hope if you give me your heart. That in a sentence is the theme of this whole service, as you will see later, of our worship of everything. I will give you hope if you give me your heart. If with all your heart you truly seek me, you'll find me and your future is secure. Well, now that's the heart of the message of the promise here. Now, it's not easy to test whether you're wholehearted. I took the hymn book this morning and I just went through one or two hymns. And I, I read this, for example, uh, both by Germans as it happens. There have been some great German hymn writers. God has moved and done lovely things in that country as well as dreadful things. Listen to this. Though waves and storms go o'er my head, though strength and health and friends be gone, though joys be withered, all and dead, though every comfort be withdrawn, on this my steadfast soul relies. Father, thy mercy never dies. That's wholehearted, isn't it? Every comfort withdrawn. Could you say that this morning? If God took your bed away and the roof over your head, and your central heating, and your car, every comfort. Could you still say wholeheartedly, he's all I need? Or take another hymn. I just turned the pages and I came to the Marseillaise of the Reformation. Ein Festerberg, a safe stronghold, our God is still. Listen. And though they take our life, goods, honor, children, wife, yet is their profit small. These things shall vanish all, the city of God remaineth. Now these are hymns written by wholehearted people. Do you see? And one of the reasons why many people can't find God is they're so half-hearted about it. They've given part of their heart to their career, another part to their family, another part to their home and garden, another part to this, that and the other. And they've only got a bit left for God. And, and they, they would like God, they would like to find him, but there's only a little bit of their heart to find him with. And there's only a little bit of their heart for him to occupy. And he can't get in. He's too big. If with all your heart you'll find me and your future is absolutely secure. Rosy. Wonderful. Do you get the message? That's the word of promise which Jeremiah sent to the exiles at Babylon. And since he wrote it down, I can pass it on to you this morning. Now, finally, the word of warning. The word of warning is this. By the way, do you notice that he says you'll be found of me in Babylon? 
without a temple, without a priest, without an altar, without a sacrifice, you will be found of me. And that's the beginning of the New Testament. It's the beginning of the synagogue. And we are a synagogue this morning. We have no high altar. We have no priest. We have no sacrifice. This is not a temple. But if you seek me with all your heart, you will be found of me. Now the word of warning. Avoid prophecy in Babylon. Jeremiah is wondering how his letter will be received. He knows that these false prophets are saying Jeremiah is a liar. He's crazy. Put him in the stocks. He knows they're saying Babylon will fall in a year or two and we can all go home. And he knows it's not true and he's thinking so. He sends in the letter a warning. He says, beware of that man Ahab. Beware of that man Zedekiah. I know them both. I know what they're saying. They're telling you what you want to hear. But it's a lie. You see, a man of God who's going to speak the word of God has to do two things. He has to express the truth and he has to expose the lie. And that's why preaching becomes unpopular. I've had people say to me, I wish you'd stick to the positive thing, things and keep off the negative. You know, just be positive and say all the things we can say yes to, but don't say no to anything. That's exactly what our world wants. The world wants the kind of tolerance rather than the truth of antithesis whereby if this is true, that is not true. The world wants both to be true and a mixture to be made. But it can't be. If Christianity is right, every other religion in the world is wrong. And you can't get over that antithesis. But the world wants to hear us say, all religions are roads leading to the same goal and you take the best bits of each and lump it all together and have what uh, Foster Dulles started, the Congress of World Faiths in the Cow Palace of San Francisco, and you're home and dry, you've got a world religion. But it never works. You see, truth is always seen against lies. And if the word of God is true, then things that men say are lies, and you've got to say both. And the word of God is you will be in Babylon 70 years, and the lie is you will be in Babylon two years. And the prophet has to expose the lie as well as express the truth. So Jeremiah says, I tell you, I've been preaching in Jerusalem and you're in Babylon because you didn't listen to what I said. And I tell you now that those who are left in Jerusalem will be followed by famine, sword, pestilence until there's nothing left of them. You see if I'm true. You see if my word is right. And don't you go listening to those false prophets of yours. Especially that man who says who's been writing letters back here to Jerusalem and saying, get Jeremiah, that crazy man, in a collar and stocks. Jeremiah says, I tell you what will happen to Shemaiah. Nebuchadnezzar will throw him into fire. And that was Nebuchadnezzar's way of dealing with those whom he regarded as potential rivals and traitors. That's what he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or what was done to them later. And so Shemaiah, he'll be thrown in the fire. That would only anticipate his ultimate end because, in fact, those who distort God's word, those who deny it, those who reject it, those who say the opposite, they are heading for fire anyway. There's a lake of fire for false prophets. And if Nebuchadnezzar just brought that a little early, it was, in any case, what was happening. God says, I am he who knows. There it is, verse 23. I am the one who knows. No one else does. I tell you, Mr. Callahan doesn't know where we're going. Nor does Brezhnev. Nor does Jerry Ford. They don't know where we're going. The Lord says, I am the one who knows. And he doesn't need any other witnesses. He says, and I am witness. And so God needs no one but himself to tell the truth. He's the one who knows and he's his own witness. What more do you need? The word of God has to be taken on God's word, if I may put it that way. I didn't think of saying that till just that second. So let me repeat it. It sounded rather good to me. <laughs> <laughs> the word of God must be taken on God's word. I am the one who knows and I am witness, says the Lord. Well, now, so much for the letter and I could leave it there. Except for one thing, I just want to apply chapter 29 to you because I am speaking to exiles this morning. Every one of you is a foreigner. You do not belong to the United Kingdom in the last analysis. That is if you are a Christian. 
Because the simple fact is that the day you became a Christian, that day you became an alien in the United Kingdom. You became a citizen of another kingdom. You became a sojourner, a pilgrim passing through. You no longer belong. Here's a quote from a letter written from one Christian very early on to a man who was not impressed with Christianity, a man called Diognetus. And this letter was written to Diognetus by an early Christian. It is now known as the Epistle to Diognetus. It was written way, way back, nearly 1900 years ago, or 18 and a half centuries. This is what he says. Christians are not marked out from the rest of mankind by their country or their speech or their customs. They dwell in cities, both Greek and barbarian, each as his lot is cast, following the customs of the region in clothing and food and in the outward things of life generally. Yet they manifest the wonderful and openly paradoxical character of their own state. They inhabit the land of their birth, but as temporary residents thereof. They take all their share of responsibilities as citizens and endure all disabilities as aliens. Every foreign land is their native land and every native land is a foreign land. They pass their days upon earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. Therefore, a letter to exiles is so appropriate to you. And the word of advice is, pray. While you are in exile in the United Kingdom, pray. The welfare of the United Kingdom is your welfare, as long as you're in it. That's why the New Testament commands us to lift up holy hands and to pray for those set in authority over us, the Prime Minister. Will you pray for him? We have had an acknowledgement from his private secretary to our letter of last week with its 900 signatures. But that is all we've had. And you know, I very, verily believe that God guided us to send that letter and to send him the word of God when we did. Because that man is under such pressure now and making errors of judgment which could cost us everything. And he needs the word of God. And he needs to listen to God. And my, how this week has shown it. Thank God that George Thomas, the speaker, is, is a Christian. And in the middle of a debate, just a few days ago, he called an MP over to him. The debate was getting a bit boring. And he called the MP over to him. And he said to that MP, what do you think? He said, I was preaching at a, a rally just uh, recently. And he said, I made an appeal at the end. And he said, many people accepted Christ. And the MP went and sat down. In the middle of a boring debate, there was... <laughs> News like that going on in the House of Commons. Isn't that great? But we need far more people, Christians in the House of Commons, far more. Pray that we may get up to the 5% needed to change the character of our House of Commons. The number of Christian MPs at the moment on all sides, in all parties, is around 2%. That needs to be trebled before the trends were reversed nationally. So you're in exile. You don't belong to this United Kingdom, but in its welfare lies your welfare. Pray for it. Build your houses, live in them, plant your gardens, eat their produce. But remember, don't ever get so rooted down in the United Kingdom that you're not ready to go home. Expect to return to the promised land. Never get your roots so deep down in that house that you've built, in that garden that you've produced. Or in your children or your grandchildren that you can't leave it and go at a moment's notice to be with the Lord. You see the letter to the exiles? And beware of the false prophets who say smooth, easy things. It's all right. Everything will turn out, out all right. It's only a little economic phase. We'll get through. We've muddled through before. Dunkirk and all that. Don't believe it. Don't listen to it. Here we have no abiding city. And I believe God's hand of judgment is on this land. And until he's fulfilled the intents of his mind, we can do nothing about it. But we can pray. And we can support our government. It may not be the government you voted for at the last election. But in its welfare lies your welfare. And if parliamentary democracy breaks down in this country, it's you who will suffer. Because you are in the United Kingdom. Jeremiah's letter to the exiles is so appropriate. Go home and read it more. I have no time to say more about it. I want to get on to the other chapter, chapter 30. Now we have not a letter but a book, and it's a book that lasts through to the end of chapter 33, and it's full of such good news that it's been called by scholars the book of consolation. 
Jewish scholars say chapters 30 to 33 are the book of consolation. And we're ready for consolation. But my wife was at home this morning was listening to a tape of Colin Urquhart's um, just to feed her own soul. And uh, I just heard a glimpse through the bedroom door of a few sentences that she was listening to and used it in a prayer before the service. Colin was saying this, the word of God divides, the spirit of God unites. The word of God wounds, the spirit of God heals. And the trouble is we're all interested in the healing and the unity. We don't like the wounding and the dividing. But where the word of God is preached, a church will be divided. And then the spirit will unite it again. And this is God's spiritual surgery. And it was necessary for us to go through chapters 1 to 28, which are doom and gloom, which hurt, which cut, and which certainly got a lot of response, both positive and negative. I don't think I've ever had so many letters from people. But we are now into the healing, the consolation, the lifting up, the spirit, healing, the wounds. I divide this chapter into three parts again. It's good news. It's the gospel. And Jeremiah, though he's dead and gone, yet speaks because he wrote it down in a book. Nineteen times, actually, in this one chapter, I got the figure wrong earlier, nineteen times in this one chapter, God says, I will. He said it ten times in chapter 29, but now nineteen times. God is, is marrying himself to our future. I will, I will, I will. Now, I divide it into three parts. God is going to remove their panic. God is going to remove their pain. God is going to remove their privation. Or in the terms in which it's said in this chapter, their terrors will be ended, their wounds will be healed, and their fortunes restored. Those are the three parts of the chapter. First of all, the terrors ended. Now, I noticed something here that made me very excited. You know, the Jews say there's only one God. They can't accept the Trinity. I don't know how they managed to get around it. God said, let us make man in our own image. And look at here, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, we have heard. We. Only one God? Well, yes, there is. But you know, in the Hebrew, it's hero Israel, the Lord our gods. The Lord is one. We. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a panic, terror, no peace. A time of real distress when men are behaving like a woman having a child, in pain with pale face, sweat on their brow, trying to contain the pain. What's gone wrong when men do this? Time of real distress. Yes, Israel has been through more distress than any other nation on earth. Yet, says the Lord, he will be saved out of it. And I will break the yoke. I've brought the yoke back again, or at least Harold Wakeford has lent it to me again, this 250-year-old yoke. Do you know, God spoke more last Sunday through my wearing this than anything I said. I really believe, you know, because that's what Jeremiah did. He put it on. And at least one person in deep need in this congregation just cannot get this picture out of their minds and realize that God can break the chains and break the yoke. Remember that that false prophet Hananiah broke it and said, Jeremiah, rubbish. And he broke the wooden yoke. So God said, I'll replace it with an iron one. See what Hananiah can do with that one. But God can break the iron. Iron gates can yield. And brass is just broken before God. And God says, I'll take that yoke and I'll take it off and I'll smash it. Why? In order that they may be free? No. I told you last week, and if you weren't here last week, let me repeat it. Because it's repeated here. I will break your yoke in order that you may serve the Lord. There's no such thing as freedom in this world. You either serve yourself or someone else or God. And there's only one whose service is perfect freedom, and it's not yourself. 
That is the worst kind of slavery, to be a slave to yourself and to have the yoke of your own pride and greed bearing you down. But God can break that yoke. And he can break also the yoke of Babylon or the yoke of whatever foreign power. He can break that yoke. But he does it in order that he may put another yoke on your shoulders and that you may bend that stiff neck of yours to a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. That's why God said to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may be free. No, he didn't say that. He said, let my people go that they may serve me. And God only frees you that you may be enslaved to him. That's why Paul called himself a bond slave of the Lord Jesus. He'd been a slave to the law, a slave to self. Now he was a bond slave to Jesus. The only question that is before mankind is whose slave are you going to be? There's no point in talking about freedom. The question is whose slave you're going to be. You will either be your own slave or someone else's or God's. And God says, I'm going to break your yoke. The fear will go. And when you're serving me and David, your king, when you're doing that, then none will make you afraid. And everyone who oppresses you, I will oppress. And then God says this, and I want you to notice because it seals the doom of the United Kingdom. Any nation, he says, all the nations that have troubled you, all the nations that have troubled you, I will bring to a full end. But you, I will never make a full end of you. And on the basis of that, and on the basis of the muddle that the British got into when we had the trusteeship of Palestine and the Jews, on that basis, I say very simply, the days of the United Kingdom are finished. They are already numbered. Because God says, I'll make a full end of all the nations that cause you trouble. And we have done so. Not least by our folly after World War I in making the same promise to both Jew and Arab that they could both have the land. And when we got into a mess as the result of that two-faced promise, we just got out and left it to the United Nations. I know it cost us lives of our boys. I know we tried to be fair. I know we tried to do what we could. But we made a mess of it as a nation. And God has written our doom in that. I'm not telling you when it will be, but he said, I will make a full end, a full end of all the nations that trouble you. But of you, I'll never make a full end. So I make this prediction that on the last day of human history, there will be a nation called Israel. But I don't know what other nations there'll be. So your terror, your fear, and how they have feared going through that museum of the Holocaust in Jerusalem in silence, seeing the photographs of old men, naked women, and little children, faces filled with fear. Here is God saying in this book for the future for them, none will make you afraid. No more panic. No more panic. And that museum in Jerusalem is just filled with panic and fear. And there'll be no more. Now the second thing that will be taken away is all that pain. All that pain. It's a deep pain. The medical language is used now from verse 12 onwards. Your hurt is incurable. Your wound is grievous. There's no medicine for your wound. No healing. Why do you cry out over your hurt? Your health, your wounds, it's, it's medical terms. But what is the wound? What is hurting? I don't think it's the physical suffering because they didn't have much in the early days in Babylon. They lived in comparative physical comfort. The hurt is that they'd lost their land. They were far from home and they couldn't go back. And God says, look, your hurt at the human level is incurable because your guilt is great, your sins are flagrant. Don't you realize that your sickness is due to your sin? There is a connection between those two things, not in every case, but there can be a connection and you can be sick because you are sinning. Body and soul are too intimately bound up for you to be able to do things with your soul and not suffer in your body and not do things to your body and not suffer in your soul. You're, you're one being. And your sickness is very great and it's incurable and you'll never get this hurt out of your soul. And then God says, what is impossible I can do? I'll heal your incurable wounds. 
Do you know there are many of you listening to my voice who've got wounds in your spirit. Some of them go back to your childhood. Some of them go back just a few years. Some may even have been caused this week. There are wounds. And when somebody else touches them, they hurt. There are hurts and they, they limit your Christian service and they spoil your freedom in the Lord. They're hurts. They're wounds. And you say they're incurable. I'm too old. I've had it too long and I'll never get over it. That's what we say. And God says, listen, I will restore health to you and your wounds I will heal all the hurts there have been. That's a lovely promise, isn't it? Why will God do this? Look, because they have called you an outcast and said it is Zion for whom no one cares. And you know, that hurts God. That touches him on a very sensitive point. Because God cares more than anyone else. And for anyone to say he doesn't care for his people really gets God on the raw. And God says, I will heal the incurable wound. Because I do not want anybody saying about you, no one cares for that person. I find that very touching. And so if you've got a wound, take it to the Lord. If you've got a hurt, take it to the Lord. Because if you keep it, somebody could say, no one cares. And God says, I care. And so I'm going to remove your pain. And then finally, their privation. And here we have a lovely picture of stable prosperity. Oh, it's thrilling to read. A city rebuilt, a palace in the city, children playing around in the streets, songs, music, dancing, making merry, and everything beautiful, a lovely city to live in, a kind of garden suburb with, with plenty of playground for the children and, and the old folk looking on. And, did, you, did you catch the vision? It's a lovely picture. Economically, culturally, politically, socially, everything put right, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob. And the climax comes in verse 21. They will be ruled over by someone from among themselves, yet someone who will be able to approach God. Now that's the kind of ruler we need, isn't it? We need someone we feel is one of us that we can identify with, that we can say, well, he's like us. And we need somebody who can get close to God. Listen, the prince, their prince shall be one of themselves. Their ruler shall come out of their midst. You know, the Jews have had too many rulers from outside themselves. They've been ruled over by Syria, by Egypt, by Greece, by Rome. Wherever they've been dispersed as exiles, they've been ruled over by an alien. Only one English prime minister has been Jewish. That was Benjamin Disraeli. Otherwise, the Jews in this country have been ruled over by a Gentile. The Jews in America are ruled over by Gentiles. You will have a prince, one of yourselves. You know who that's referring to, don't you? And the climax comes, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. It's the best thing about the city. Not that there are children with plenty of playgrounds. Not that there are palaces and fine buildings. Not that there's peace and prosperity and security. But that at the heart of it, God is relating to his people. You notice there's no temple mentioned here, did you? No temple. If you've got God, you can do without a temple. And you know that these very words are taken from Jeremiah 30 and taken straight through to the end of the Bible. Let me now apply chapter 30 to you. As chapter 29 is appropriate to you because if you're a Christian, you're an exile, an alien, you don't belong here, your citizenship is elsewhere. And therefore pray for this land, its welfare is your welfare, but never get so involved in it that you can't leave it. Look for the return. You are exiles, but now let me apply chapter 30. You are one day going home. 
and there's a city whose streets you cannot imagine for beauty. And that city is described in the last two pages of the Bible, chapters 21 22 of the book of Revelation. And it's described there, and there is no temple in the city. Why? Because God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Same words. That's what makes society stable and peaceful and prosperous. We cannot solve our economic problems with an economic policy. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will look after themselves. When in the middle of social life there is a relationship between God and the people, then and only then will our other problems get sorted out. There are those who will say that's oversimplistic. Let's put you in Downing Street and see what you could do. No, I wouldn't go. <laughs> Never be asked. But <laughs> I believe that there is need for politicians, and I'm not a politician. And I pray that God will raise up Christian politicians from this congregation who will be skilled at politics, but who will be men who start from their relationship with God. And then work it out politically, as I have to work it out in the church. Let them work it out in the House of Commons. As all of us have to work it out where we work and where we live. Now comes the shock, and I'm afraid it is a shock. Verses 22 to 24, after this lovely picture of panic removed, pain gone, privations ended, after that lovely picture and that climax, you will be my people and I will be your God, we get three verses full of God's wrath and anger. Just don't get it, do you? What a shock. I wish I could have stopped at verse 22. Lovely preacher's climax, isn't it? But the Bible is an honest book. And it goes on to say, before you can have that stable prosperity, there will be a stormy prelude. There will be an exhibition of God's wrath and anger such as has never been seen before. A whirling tempest, a storm. And the chapter finishes with these words. You may not understand it now, but in the latter days you will. You will. And the book of Revelation is not only the book that describes that new Jerusalem, that beautiful city that we're all going to live in. The book of Revelation is full of God's anger and wrath. Have you noticed that? Because I'm afraid God must fulfill his anger and wrath before he can bring us to that city. And there will be a time of distress not only for Jacob but for all nations. It is through great tribulation that we enter the kingdom. And I believe we Christians have to be utterly realistic. The day of wrath has to come before the day of God's glory. It is true of Israel as a nation. Have you noticed that for the first time Jeremiah is no longer calling them Jerusalem or Judah. He is calling them Jacob. He's not done that before. But all through chapter 30 he says Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. Why Jacob? Because Jerusalem and Judah are only part of the nation, the word Jacob covers all twelve tribes because he was the father of the twelve. And he's saying, now this future is for the whole of Israel. People debate as to where the ten lost tribes are. I tell you, God hasn't lost them. <laughs> God hasn't lost them. And this future is for all twelve tribes, and so it's the future of Jacob. But Jacob must go through a time of distress and God's wrath before that future. And every time I go to Israel today, I come back with my heart breaking, thinking, when will it happen to them? You see, they've come back to the land, but not to the Lord. And that plea, if with all your heart you truly seek me, is still not responded to by the tribes of Israel. They're still not turning to him with all their hearts. And so there must be a time of distress for Jacob. Yet he will be saved out of it. My last word is this. Not only is there a name Jacob first used in this chapter, there's another name that's in this chapter. It isn't actually in print, but it's there. It's the name Jesus. He wasn't given that name in Jeremiah's days, so it isn't used. But what is used is, 
I will break your yoke that you may serve the Lord and David the king. But David the king had already been dead 400 years. More, 600 years. He was dead and gone. You will serve the Lord and David your king. They would understand what that meant. It meant a descendant of the royal line of David. And when it talks about a prince who will come out from among you, one of yourselves, and yet who will approach God, we've got a perfect picture of Jesus. Born in Bethlehem, born in human frame, one of us, one of ourselves. Even we Gentiles can say that. Very man of very man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was from ourselves. And yet he is approaching the throne of God so, so closely as more closely than any man would dare to approach God. And that gives us our prince. And the future of Jacob and the future of Jesus are not two futures, just one. The future of Jew and Gentile are not two futures, but one. Their distress is our distress. And we are the other sheep that were not of that fold whom Jesus has brought. And there will be one flock, one fold, one shepherd, and Jew and Gentile together will enter into this glorious future if, if, with all our hearts, we truly seek him. Half-hearted people make Jesus sick. He would rather they were cold than lukewarm. But whole-hearted people not only find God, they are found by God, which is even better, because God is looking for them. He came to seek and to save, and you will be found by him. And then I've made plans for your welfare. So who's for the welfare state of God? By the grace of God we are, and we have no abiding city, and our citizenship is there. And we're aliens here. We'll support our kingdom. For in its welfare lies our welfare. But we are not so deeply rooted here that God couldn't call us at a moment's notice to go home. Let us pray. Father, thank you for speaking to us through your word, written so long ago, yet so alive and so relevant. And we pray now that as we come and respond to that word in worship, that there may be nothing half-hearted about us, but that we may search for you with all our hearts and be found of you and have a hope and a future that nothing can dim or take away. So, Lord, we praise your name that you break the yoke, our chains fell off, our heart was free, we rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amen. Amen.